Thank you very much, Fernand Clavis. So I will introduce our second speaker, who is Dr. Claire Rougeoy, um, research director at the CNRS team, uh, which is called Non-Coding RNAs, Differentiation and Development of and sorry, development. Uh, it's a team of the Epigenetics and Cell Fate Institute. So Dr. Claire Rougeoy received her PhD in 1996 from the University Pierre and Marie Curie in Paris. She was recruited to the CNRS in 1999 after her postdoctoral studies at the Harvard Medical School in Boston. And she has been a deputy director of the Epigenetics and Cell Fate Institute since 2009. And she's one of the founding members of this institute. Dr. Claire Rougeoy was awarded the 2007 Bronze Medal of the CNRS and the 2019 Silver Medal of the CNRS. So as I said, Dr. Rougeoy is a research director at the CNRS team, which is called Non-Coding Arena's Differentiation and Development, and she is about to present her work. And the title of her presentation is Epigenetic Regulation of X, Chromosome Activity in Mammals. So you can uh, partage your PowerPoint if you want. OK, so thank you for this uh, nice introduction. Um, and thank you for the, for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here tonight. Uh, I'm, ju I'm just going to make a, a correction. I, I've been deputy director only since 2019 and not nine. So I don't want to take the the place of Valérie yes, Mézier was a deputy director <laughs> at the stage. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Uh, I'm just looking for uh, my screen. Here it is. So do you see my presentation? Yes, Yes. Can see it. OK, so uh, I'm going to be talking about um, stem cells as well, but uh, stem cells of embryonic origin uh, and how we can use those stem cells to uh, explore the epigenetic regulation of X chromosome activity in mammals. And I'll be mostly talking about uh, human today. So in, in mammals, the, the presence of heteromorphic sex chromosome uh, with an X chromosome that is quite a large and carries a large number of genes and a Y chromosome, which is much smaller and, and carries a, a small number of genes, as indicated here, leads to a theoretical uh, dosage imbalance for X-linked genes between fem females and, and males. Uh, practically, this imbalance is compensated for by the, uh, X, the inactivation of one of the two X chromosomes. Do you see my pointer here? Yes. Uh, by the inactivation of one of the two uh, X chromosomes in, um, in, in females. So the process of X chromosome inactivation takes place in, in all mammals, uh, both in uh, um, metatherians and in utherians, so placental mammals, and have been so far mainly uh, investigated in, in the mouse where uh, most of the actors of the process and the dynamics of the process has been well elucidated. X chromosome inactivation is a random process, meaning that it uh, can affect either the maternal X chromosome or the paternal X chromosome. And, and ultimately, uh, each female mammal is made of roughly half of the cells in which the paternal X is inactivated and half of the cells in which the maternal X is inactivated. So, so the consequence of that is that uh, female mammals are um, mosaics, and, and this can be seen is in this picture of a well-known uh, 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 cat, sorry about that, <laughs> where you see patches of uh, hair with a dark color and patches of hair with a red color, which is a result of the X inactivation process. This can be seen uh, in a different way with, through these really nice studies uh, in which uh, fluorescent reporters were introduced on the two uh, X chromosomes. So a red fluorescent protein on one X chromosome and a green fluorescent protein on the other X chromosome. And then you can 
look for the expression of either uh, red fluorescence or green fluorescence in all the animal. And you can see that instead of having a yellow pattern, which would indicate that both X chromosomes are active, you do see this uh, uh, chimerism with part of the cells in which you have one X active and part of the cells in which you have the other X active. So studies in the mouse has led to the identification of the main uh, trigger for the X inactivation process, which is the exist long non-coding RNA. So the exist gene, which is located on the X chromosome, gives rise to a long non-coding RNA that has the striking property of uh, not only remaining in the nucleus, but staying associated to the chromosome from which it is expressed. So this can be seen uh, by uh, RNA fish experiment as an accumulation of uh, exist RNA forming a cloud that corresponds to the territory of the inactive X chromosome. The accumulation of exist on one of the two X chromosome in female cells is one of the earliest uh, feature of uh, X chromosome inactivation. And this is the trigger of the process. And we know uh, now that exist is going to interact with a series of factors that are involved in uh, chromatin remodeling, uh, nuclear organization, and, and uh, RNA modification. And all together, this will lead to the transcriptional silencing and chromatin reorganization of the inactive X chromosome and to the formation of the condensed inactive X chromosome that was uh, initially described in the late 40s by uh, Dr. Barr as the Barr body that you can see here on this uh, image. So as I said uh, earlier, X inactivation has been mainly studied in the mouse where uh, the dynamic of the process has been studied throughout development. And, and this has revealed a tight correlation between uh, X chromosome inactivation and uh, development and cellular differentiation. So what is indicated on this slide is uh, simultaneously the pattern of exist expression during uh, early development. So pre-implantation development, implantation and post-implantation development and the, the occurrence of uh, X chromosome inactivation. So you see on this slide that X chromosome inactivation in rodents occurs in two waves. There is an initial wave of X chromosome inactivation that starts uh, right after zygotic genome activation. And this initial wave is uh, not random this time, but it is imprinted, meaning that it is uh, always the paternal X chromosome that is inactivated. Imprinted X inactivation is transiently um, lost and the, the X chromosome is reactivated uh, around the implantation stage. And it is following implantation that the second wave of X chromosome inactivation occurs, which is this time a random, giving to this a mosaic females, uh, which we discussed previously. What is striking in the mouse is the fact that there is a complete correlation between uh, expression of exist and X chromosome inactivation. And this is a, a coherence with the demonstration that was made in the mouse that this is absolutely necessary for uh, to trigger X chromosome inactivation. As I said, X chromosome inactivation is tightly coupled to cell differentiation and mouse embryonic stem cells have been an instrumental model to study uh, the molecular determinants of X chromosome inactivation as uh, undifferentiated mouse ES cells carry two active X chromosomes, one of which is uh, randomly inactivated upon uh, differentiation. So the, the, the feature of the X chromosome in human has been studied uh, much later. And, and what has been realized in the early 2010s is that uh, the, the dynamics of X chromosome inactivation is completely different from what we had learned in the mouse. Uh, what was striking from an analysis of uh, human pre-implantation embryos is, the, is the, the uncoupling between the expression of exist and the actual silencing of the chromosome. So what is indicated on this slide is that the expression of exist starts much earlier 
than uh, much before the, the, the actual process of uh, chromosome silencing. And there is a, a transient phase during the pre-implantation development during which there is accumulation, not only expression of exist, but accumulation of exist uh, on the X chromosome. Actually, at this stage, exist is expressed from the two X chromosomes in female and from the single X in the male. And this doesn't lead to X chromosome inactivation. So the question that interests us in the lab is to understand how is X chromosome inactivation regulated uh, in human, because it seems to be quite different from what we know in the mouse. And how is X chromosome inactivation coupled to cell differentiation? So in the mass, we know that this coupling goes at least in part through a regulation of exist and other uh, factors by pluripotency factors. But we see in the human that uh, the, the timing of X chromosome inactivation is not controlled by the, the expression of exist, but rather by, by its activity. So this is one of the questions that we are trying to address. So how can we, can we address this question? So one of the obvious models uh, based on what had been done in the mouse was to turn our attention, sorry, to uh, human embryonic stem cells. However, in contrast to the mouse, uh, most uh, human embryonic stem cells, female human embryonic stem cells have already undergone X chromosome inactivation and uh, carry an inactive X that is uh, coated by exist. Nevertheless, we took uh, these human embryonic stem cells to uh, undergo an unbiased approach. And what we did was to perform RNA-seq experiment, so total RNA-seq experiment, and to use uh, specific filters to try to identify a uh, new transcript from the X chromosome that could be specific for this uh, early developmental stage. So we compared this data with that obtained from uh, differentiated cells. And with this analysis, we came to the identification of several novel uh, long not coding uh, RNA gene on the X chromosome, one of which uh, retain our attention. So this is the exact uh, gene which is located way distal from the exist locus. So this is a region that is overall uh, gene poor and uh, from which we noticed uh, transcription covering a large region, so over 250 kilobases, uh, right in between those two protein coding genes. So the reason why we got interested in this transcript is uh, because when we started to look at the distribution of the exact long non-coding RNA at the single cell level, we observed a very specific uh, pattern uh, where we could see accumulation of exact in a form that closely resemble that of exist. But the main difference is that exist codes the inactive X chromosome, whereas exact codes the active X chromosome. So this was uh, the first transcript beyond exist that was able to accumulate at this level around the chrom chromosome from which it is expressed. And uh, through um, sequence analysis, to which I will come back a bit later, we uh, determined that uh, the exact gene is specific to higher primate and is not found in, in lower primate or in other species such as uh, mouse. We looked at the expression of exact, so from a pluripotent stem cell to differentiated cells, and we noticed that its expression is lost during cell differentiation and is reacquired during reprogramming and lost when you re-differentiate those uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. So the expression of this long non-coding RNA is tightly linked to, to pluripotency. So the, the, the obvious question that we had was to know whether exact is controlling X chromosome inactivation. And we also wanted to know how the expression of exact is, how exact is regulation and how its expression is uh, restricted to uh, the pluripotent embryonic stem cells. So in order to get uh, functional insights into exact, we, we turn our attention to human embryos. So we wanted to make sure that exact was not an artifact uh, of cells in culture. And we took advantage of single cell RNA-seq data sets that were uh, available. Uh, so we, we exploited two types of data sets that are represented here, one with uh, many, more, many more cells. 
And, and with this data set, we investigated the expression of exist and exact uh, at the single cell level in uh, throughout uh, human pre-implantation uh, development. So what we noticed is that uh, there is a slight maternal contribution of exact as we can detect some level of exact expression before uh, the zygotic activation. But overall, the, the burst in exact expression occurs from the eight cell stage, uh, similarly to that uh, of exist. And in fact, when we looked throughout the early stage of development, we could see that th there is a high correlation between the expression of exist and the expression of exact. And this is not only because those two genes are uh, from the same chromosome, I mean, from the X chromosome, but really uh, the correlation between the expression of exact and that of exist is the highest compared to all other genes of the X chromosome. So the fact that these two genes are co-expressed suggests that they might either be co-regulated or that they could participate to a given uh, a developmental process. So these single cell RNA-seq analysis indicate that indeed exist and exact can be expressed simultaneously in the same cell. And, and we know that uh, exist and exact have the ability to code the chromosome from which it is expressed. So we wanted to know at the single cell uh, resolution, how was the, the, the transcript of exist and exact organizing within the nucleus. So for this, we did a simultaneous RNA fish for exist in green and exact in red in, in female uh, blastocyst. And uh, with this analysis, we could observe that both X chromosome would express uh, concomitantly exist and exact. And that was the case for most of the cells uh, within, the, within the embryo. But looking at the image uh, with more attention, we noticed that even though uh, the two transcripts were expressed from each X chromosome, they were not at all uh, overlapping. And in fact, there is uh, exclusion of each other territory uh, at the single cell level. So there is absolutely no overlap between uh, the territory occupied by the exact RNA and the territory occupied by the exist RNA, suggesting at least that uh, there is no interaction between the two transcripts and that they could play uh, opposite maybe function. So embryo were very uh, were powerful to uh, at least conclude that exact is not an artifact in vitro and conclude that it is indeed expressed throughout pre-implantation uh, development concomitantly to exist yet in distinct territories. But we, uh, we need a model to uh, go further into the understanding of exact function, exact regulation. So um, as I said previously, prime pluripotent stem cells are not a good model for this because prime pluripotent stem cells are in a post X chromosome inactivation state. As I said, the, the X, one of the two X chromosomes is already inactivated. But there are several um, protocols that have been recently elaborated to reset human embryonic stem cell into a naive pluripotent state that is uh, supposed to mimic uh, the early human development and so the pre-X inactivation status. So we went on with these naive pluripotent uh, human ES cells. And what we did first was to analyze their transcriptome in relation to that of early uh, embryos. An analysis of um, principal components, I've lost my, uh, oops, sorry about that. Analysis of, the, of this data set uh, by a principal component or dimension reduction indicated that the naive uh, ESL that are labeled here, uh, CR, CR not for Claire Rougeur, but for chemically reset, these uh, naive cell um, share their uh, transcriptome to some extent with uh, uh, embryos of day five and six of development. So they, they have similarities uh, in terms of uh, transcriptome to uh, pre-implantation embryos. So what about the X chromosome uh, activity status? So what the way we approached this question was to look at the allelic expression of X-linked gene. So if one of the two X chromosome is uh, inactivated, the, gene are gonna be, the genes are gonna be uh, what we call monoallelically expressed, so expressed only from one of the two X chromosome, 
whereas they should become bilatically expressed if the two X are active. So to do this analysis, we relied on a series of uh, polymorphism between the two X chromosome carried by the, the, the human uh, organic stem cell that we used. And what you can, and we measure the, the ratio of uh, bilelic uh, expressed gene in relation to an autosome, which should be uh, bilelically expressed overall. And what you can see on this uh, slide is that while the prime uh, uh, human organic stem cells have very low level of bilelic expression from the X chromosome in agreement with one of the two X being inactive, the naive uh, cells that we obtained through this process procedure uh, had a high uh, ratio of bilelic expression. And the, those bilelically expressed genes, we can see here on this map of the chromosome, are located throughout uh, the chromosome, which uh, indicates that uh, overall, or suggests that overall, the, the X chromosome has been reactivated during the resetting of prime pluripotent stem cells into naive pluripotent stem cells. We looked at the expression of exact, uh, particularly in those stem cells, and found that, as in embryo, those stem cells are characterized by bilelic expression of exact and a bilelic expression of exist, at least in a fraction of cells. Actually, the cells that we have do not fully recapitulate the pre-implantation stage, and we have bilelic exist expression only in a fraction uh, of cells. When we looked at those image of uh, RNA fish images, both in naive embryonic stem cells that appear to recapitulate the embryo and in the embryo, we noticed that the pattern of exist was uh, quite different from what we could see in a differentiated cells where exist sits on a fully inactive X chromosome. And so we measured the dispersion of the exist uh, signal and compared it uh, to that of uh, prime human embryonic stem cells in which, as I said, this sits on a fully inactive X chromosome. And, and, we, and we noticed doing that, doing so that um, the, the, disp the, the exist cloud, both in uh, pre-implantation embryos and in naive human embryonic stem cells is much, disp much more dispersed than the exist cloud in, uh, on a fully inactive X chromosome. And so we propose that this dispersion might be linked to the incapacity of exist to trigger X chromosome silencing at this stage and possibly to the presence of exact. So as a first attempt to uh, address this question, we turn uh, to an ectopic system. So what we decided to do was to artificially introduce exact at this part of the locus into the X chromosome of mouse embryonic stem cells. So I just remind you that there is no exact uh, autologue in, in mouse embryonic stem cells. So we managed to introduce uh, the human exact locus on one of the two X chromosomes in uh, mouse embryonic stem cells that are uh, in a naive state of pluripotency. And, and so first thing that we observed was that in the mouse, the human exact RNA was kept the ability to code uh, the chromosome from which it is expressed. So it could be expressed and code the chromosome from which it is expressed. So what we wanted to know was uh, whether this, uh, the presence and expression of exact on one of the two X chromosomes was somehow impacting on X chromosome inactivation. So the power of mass CSLs, uh, female mouse ES cells is that they do undergo, as I said before, uh, X random X chromosome uh, inactivation upon differentiation. So the question was to know whether this uh, inactivation was still random in the presence of exact. And what we observed was in fact that it was not the case and there was a bias uh, toward the inactivation of the, the wild type X chromosome. So in uh, 75% of the cells approximately, it was the wild type X chromosome that was inactivated, whereas it was only in 25% of the cells that the chromosome that carries the exact transgene uh, that was inactivated. So these data suggest that somehow the, the, the integration of exact or the expression of exact is preventing exist from accumulating and silencing the chromosome. 
So to validate those findings, uh, what we decided to do was to lock down exact in this transgenic model in order to uh, uh, determine whether it was the transgene or the expression of the transcript that was uh, important. So we knocked down exact and managed to uh, reduce the size of the, of the cloud of exact in these cells. And upon exact knockdown, we observed a reversion toward random X chromosome inactivation in this context, uh, further suggesting that it is the accumulation of exact that prevents the exist from inactivating the chromosome, from accumulating and inactivating the chromosome. So these uh, studies, which are to some extent quite artificial because we use this uh, ectopic system, suggested a role for exact in controlling this localization and ability to silence the X chromosome. But this, of course, must be done in a more relevant context. And these studies are uh, uh, being undergone in the lab uh, and in order to study the, the, the role of exact in early pre-implantation human development. What we wanted also to investigate, as I said before, is uh, the, the regulation of exact expression. And if we think that exact might have a role in antagoni antagonizing uh, exist, uh, we, it is important to understand how the expression of exact is maintained to early developmental context and how it is switched off uh, during differentiation. So in order to uh, understand the regulation of exact, we revisited the organization of the exact uh, locus and the nearby region. And, and uh, so first of all, we, we identified another uh, transcript nearby exact that we call, uh, we gave the nice name of T113.3, which corresponds to the coordinate of this transcript on the X chromosome map. And what we, we noticed uh, quite uh, early on was that the promoter of exact and, and T113 were both derived from a transposable element and for, from various classes of uh, endogenous retroviruses, which are uh, remnant of ancient uh, viral infection. So exact uh, promoter derived from an LTR5 uh, class of retro element, whereas and of K, whereas T113.3 derived from an H LTR7. Both uh, these elements and both the promoter of exact and the promoter of T113 are conserved only in higher primates and are not conserved in a resus or lower primates, uh, indicating that uh, exact and T113 uh, apparently evolved simultaneously to some extent and appear uh, after the divergence of the uh, hominoid lineage from the, the lower uh, primates. In terms of uh, expression, there is a strong correlation between the expression of exact here in green in, in uh, male cells, so you have only one cloud of exact, NT113, and uh, so there is very few cells in which you have either only exact or only T113. And when we look at the differentiation pattern uh, or the, the, the expression pattern of exact and T113.3 during the differentiation of human or unique stem cells, we see that their expression is tightly correlated. So this suggested to us both the co-evolution and the co-expression suggested to us that these two transcripts might be uh, somehow co co-regulated on the one hand and, and, and also that they might be, the expression might be linked to the pluripotency network. So in order to uh, check the link between the pluripotency network and the expression of exact and, and, and T113.3, what we did was to knock down uh, the expression of the core pluripotency factors. So uh, NANOG, OCT4 and SOX2. And so we realized that by uh, using a small interfering RNA, again, SOX2 concomitantly to small interfering uh, RNA, again, OCT4, we managed to uh, knock down the three pluripotency factors. So not only SOX2 and OCT4, but also NANOG. And when we did uh, the, this uh, depletion of those two uh, core pluripotency factors, we saw that this resulted in a strong uh, decrease uh, in the uh, expression level of uh, exact 
and T113. And this could not be seen when only few, one or two of the factors were uh, depleted. So this result uh, suggested that indeed exact and T113 are uh, positively regulated by uh, the pluripotency factors, but this did not tell us whether it was a direct or an indirect effect. So we uh, analyzed published uh, RNA-seq data sets for uh, OCT4, SOX2, NANOG, and other factors. Uh, and we uh, looked more specifically at the region surrounding exact and T113. And we noticed a region slightly uh, upstream of T113.3, where there was a strong binding of OCT4, SOX2, NANOG, and also of uh, CTCF, together with the accumulation of uh, H3 K27 acetylation, which is a mark for uh, enhancer activity. So this uh, led to the hypothesis that this region could serve as an enhancer for T113.3 and uh, also for exact. So to address this, uh, this question, what we decided to do was to delete uh, by CRISPR-Cas9 uh, this enhancer and we did it in, in two uh, different uh, ways. So on, on one side, we deleted only the binding site for CTCF, and on the other, we deleted the binding site for the pluripotency factors. So when we deleted the binding site for uh, CTCF, there was absolutely uh, no effect on uh, T113 expression and no strong effect on exact, uh, except for a small increase of maybe exact in the case of the deletion. So in uh, for each, uh, a CRISPR-Cas9 experiment, we collected uh, clones in which the region was deleted and clones in which the region was uh, inverted. So then when we deleted uh, the, the binding site for the pluripotency factor, we observed a strong impact on the expression of exact anti-113. And these, uh, so me, uh, more precisely, we observed a strong, quite lost complete loss of uh, T113 expression and a strong decrease of exact expression. And, and the inversion has uh, absolutely no effect, which is one of the parameters uh, to recognize an enhancer. So this uh, data suggests that this region that we identified upstream of uh, T113.3 was acting as an, an enhancer for exact and, and T113. And so we went on analyzing uh, the developmental the, the evolutionary origin of, of this uh, enhancer. And quite surprisingly, we found that this enhancer was also derived from a, a transposable element, but of a distinct family, the LTR48B uh, family. And in contrast to the uh, transposable element that constitutes uh, the promoter of exact and anti113, this LTR48B uh, uh, transposable element is present not only in hominoids, but also in uh, other primates. So this uh, specific LTR48B uh, element is able to uh, bind, as we uh, found, the pluripotency factors, OCT4, SOX2, and ANOG. And indeed, uh, we could see that the consensus binding sac for OCT4, SOX2, and NANOG is present within this uh, sequence, which uh, makes sense with the chip uh, binding profile that, that we uh, uh, found uh, from uh, chipsic data sets. However, not all the LTR48 uh, family has binding site for these OCT4, SOX2, and NANOG, and, and in fact, when we looked at, when we did a meta-analysis of the binding of uh, NANOG and OCT4 throughout all the um, LTR48B elements uh, within the genome, so there is approximately 1,000 uh, such LTR within the genome, only a small proportion of them, including uh, the one that is upstream of T113.3, are binding actually uh, OCT4 and uh, NANOG. And this contrast to what is seen for another type of transposable element, the LTR7, which is known to be a binding platform for OCT4 and NANOG, and uh, for which we indeed find uh, accumulation of those two proteins for most of the elements. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we, we propose that um, 
exact evolve through a, a serial uh, integration of transposable elements. So first the integration, the appearance of transposable element that constituted the promoter of exact together with an, another one for the promoter of T113 and the exaptation of a, uh, a transposable element that was acting as, a, as an enhancer. So that's going to be my final slide. So the conclusion of this work is uh, first that there are uh, specific mechanisms for controlling uh, a chromosomal activation in human, and that these mechanisms may involve a species specific long non coding RNA, possibly such as XACT, although we haven't proven yet that XACT has any role in controlling chromosomal activation yet in the human. But this is uh, just important to uh, keep in mind that uh, there might be limitation uh, to animal models and that you probably sometimes need to really have a cellular model that are more relevant. So we've shown that exact has evolved through the integration of retro elements and exaptation of a more ancient uh, regulatory module. And uh, we propose that exact may regulate exist activity in early development and uh, control the initiation of X chromosome inactivation, but we need uh, obviously to do further experiment in order to test these hypotheses. So I will stop there by thanking the people in the lab. Uh, this is a fantastic team, uh, not the most recent, recent picture, but the only animated one. So uh, I would like to thank uh, people who were involved in this work. So um, Céline Vallaud did a lot of work on exact. She has not left the lab and set up her own lab at the Institut Curie, Matteo Tosolini was a former a master student who did the transgenic analysis. Jean-Francois is a lecturer, I guess, whom you know uh, in the Magister and he's a fantastic colleague and he contributed to the analysis of, uh, of uh, this extramosome inactivation um, uh, process in human. And Miguel together with Madeleine did uh, most of the work and with about the, the, the evolution of Exact and the regulation of exact by the pluripotency network, and and we is doing so great job by uh, analyzing the, the chromosome activity at various stages. So I thank you for your attention, and I will stop sharing my screen, and uh, I would be happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you very much for this very clear and uh, interesting presentation. So feel free to ask a question in the in the chat. We already have a few. So one from Constance um, who asked, I was wondering if you compared your naive H9 to naive HACCs directly deri derived, sorry, from embryos in similar medium to know if the heterogeneity that you observe is coming from the reprogramming process. So we haven't done that analysis ourselves, but it's likely that this heterogeneity comes from the the reprogramming process. There's been a study recently published um, suggesting that you might um, reduce this heterogeneity by playing with FGF inhibitors. Uh, so that's something that we're currently trying and in order to see whether we can have a better, uh, I mean, better uh, representation of the early, the pre-implantation embryo. Another question from, uh, from Constance. I was wondering if you know that interacting protein is H in HAUACs and MUACs in your mouse system with the transgenes. Alors, let me, if I know what are the protein that interact with, with that, is it the question? Uh, yes, I think so. So we don't, we hope to know that soon, we should know it, but now the main, the main limitation is the level of expression of exact, so it's really, uh, it's really low expression level, so we, we are uh, afraid that it's going to be difficult to isolate the interactors, but that's definitely uh, some the direction that we're taking, and uh, I hope to be able to give you some answers one day soon. Okay, so we have another question from Clara. Do you know if that interact with the T6, the antisense, sorry, the antisense gene of exist? So the thing is, um, 
So exact, as I said, is found only in hominoid. Uh, TSIX was described mostly in the mouse. So th there was, uh, there is a TSIX autolog in the human, but it's completely different from the mouse. There's no evidence that it is expressed at this stage and that it is functional. So we, we rather believe that maybe exact could be the it would not interact, but it could functionally somehow replace TSIX. So in the mouse, TSIX is believed to somehow control the allelism of exist expression in early development, whereas exact could control the activity of exist in early development. That's that the hypothesis. But yeah. but no interaction between exist between exact and TSIX RNA. Mm -hmm. A question from Jonathan. When you go from prime to naive, you reactivate X genes, basically. But are all the genes reactivated or are some locked off? So we are limited in our analysis by the number of SNPs that we have. So we didn't, I mean, from, from this analysis, it seemed that all the genes are reactivated, but we don't have a full survey of the X. So I cannot answer this question. And what I can say is when we looked at the allelism of expression, there seems to be, I mean, both X's are active, but there seems that the, the X chromosome that was previously the active X chromosome is more active than the other one. So they are not equally active, I would say. But that should, that's probably an artifact. Okay, thank you. So an, another question from Constance. Does the deletion let, of the Let's ATA... believe that Constance, let, let's assume that Constance is a young st student. <laughs> Does the deletion of the ATA element between that and the T113 gene have any impact on the differentiation of HESCS? Uh, no, th there's no impact on differentiation. No, we at least uh, at least in, in, in male cells, when we delete this, we, we couldn't see any impact on, on cell differentiation. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for your answers. I think there is no more questions. Oh, yes. Uh, a last question from Julian. In MUSCS, when you... <clears throat> when you... Knock in. Knock in, sorry. Exact. X is just towards the wild type chromosome. Did you try to knock in, to knock in, so exact on both chromosomes in MESCs? No, we haven't done this experiment because, yeah, that, that, that's a good point. We, we haven't done it because it was not a really clean experiment. We wanted to do it with a cleaner system and to see w whether we could re well, recapitulate random or block or fully block X inactivation, but we don't have the answer to that. If there are no more questions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up. Um, so, so Constance is, is not uh, a young student, but she's a long way away. So we're really happy she's with us. And Julianne is not a young student uh, anymore, but she's in Berlin. And while, while we were listening to Claire and Fiona, uh, we just set up a future joint um, Paris-Berlin meeting with Julianne and Ilan, both of whom are ex magistero doing their postdocs there. So thanks very much. So I just want to wrap up um, first by commenting that, that I think it's, first of all, these two women, uh, Fiona and Claire, are just fantastic mentors. They're real role models uh, for, all, for all young scientists. And what you saw is that they've been following the same, very similar questions all the way through their career, going back to, to the early days of keratinocyte colonies and Claire going back to the early days of when X inactivation was first defined, but they've kept moving and kept up to date with the latest technologies and then really both of them are our model of that. I want to try just for the, the as this is the first one of the year I want to try an experiment. Can you all turn on your cameras and all turn on your microphones? Okay don't talk yet. Ah Constance with her, she has a little student with her. Okay that's great. Okay, so the reason was, uh, I just want to make one more uh, announcement. So we, I, first of all, I hope you come back for the next one. But I do want to congratulate Claire, who was just uh, nominated to the Grade de Chevalier de l'Ordre National de Mérite. Okay, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is I want to try something that we've never done by Zoom, which is, today is Claire's birthday. <laughs> I want to sing happy birthday. 
So thank you. Thank Beth. you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. We sang. Uh, we had 500 people singing "Happy Birthday" to Paul Nurse uh, last January, and I think that's the first to have uh, people in so many countries singing together to Claire. I don't know whether I could say in unison, but at least singing. Thanks very much to Claire and Fiona. Don't forget to go and listen to the Lonely Piper. Claire will be there for season two, which will be at the end of 2021. And please come back. Thanks very much to the people, so to Clarice and all the team in London who organized this and to uh, Guillaume and Joanne and all the other people from Paris and Yvonne and whoever organized it from Paris. And of course, thanks as always to Madeleine. Uh, and I promised you 2021 is going to be an amazing year for science. So, so, so get in the lab, whoever can. <laughs> and, and make sure that this is the best year that science has had for a long time. Bye, everybody.